we're still talking about prayers, but at this time, instead of the content of the prayers and their purpose and their effective and their effect in the world, we talk more about the decency and the order of prayer, how it ought to be done in an assembly, um, so as to glorify the Lord. And uh, there are some things there that need to be talked about, some details about how it is done and how it is not done that we should go through. And uh, we already discussed content, I think, pretty well. In First Timothy chapter 2, you see the first verse that we are governing... Um, what the church does, giving supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving for all. So all of our prayers are being governed. It is in this context that the eighth verse says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, that is, the husbands should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modest and self modesty and self-control, not braided hair and gold pearls or costly attire, but what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with submissiveness. I don't permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. All right, so we need to talk through these things. I understand the world kind of sees this as misogyny, and that's simply not the case. Let's talk through it. Um to show what it is. If you if you think or you're worried about whether Paul is a misogynist, I urge you to look closely at Ephesians chapter 5 about the husband loving the wife as his own church as Christ, or as his own body as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her a sacrifice. So, no, there's no hatred of women. There's there's no mistreatment of women that is allowed under any circumstances in the teaching of God. That's not what this is about. This is about the order in the public worship. He's governing our prayers and says in every place the, the men should pray. That's the, you know, testosterone-laden males. These are men or husbands. Um, leading prayer is therefore taking charge. That's what we're saying. When you are leading prayer, you're taking charge of the assembly. You have the floor. Uh, you know, you are, you're in charge, you're in control, you're uh, presiding over the assembly while you are leading prayer. So that's an important thing to understand, and that's why it has to be done, uh, as he says, by men. And he says they ought to do so by lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. They, you know, we pray by usually by folding our hands and bowing our heads. They prayed by putting their hands in the air, uh, perhaps, and looking to God uh, from where they were. You get the idea. It's just whatever it is that you do when you are praying. He said we're doing this in holiness, not, you know, perhaps for show or in uh, some kind of uh, uh, traditional motion or, or uh, routine, but rather that these are genuinely holy hands, that when we come to God, we're asking for things that are holy and that are right. We're approaching him for the right reasons, asking for the right things. He says, too, without anger or quarreling. And it's true, the content of prayers can become quarrelsome, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, they can get, you know, we talked about being specific and what we mean is specific about what you're asking for and and what why we're seeking that from God. But sometimes things can get oddly specific, can't they? <laughs> you don't want to bring your quarrels into your public prayers. And uh, anger has no place in it. That's not appropriate at all for somebody leading prayers, leading the assembly. Okay, so these are the things that are required. And again, the, the women are said to be presented, if you will, here in public. We are talking about modesty, um, godliness, and as he says, uh, to learn quietly with submissiveness. Um, they're not permitted to teach or exercise authority over a man. That is, the, the, the woman, the adult woman over the adult man, the, the, the authority over a husband or a father. She's to remain quiet. So this is not um, a general prohibition on women uh, 
having roles of leadership uh, in general in life at work or politics or whatever, this is about the context of what he said, that this is our prayers to God for the salvation of the world. This is about spiritual things, and in particular we're talking about the assembly of the saints. It's true, in the assembly of the saints, um, the woman is not to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Uh, they, they are not to take the floor. They're not to take charge in the assembly of all the saints. Um, so this is the, the teaching. And these are just for the sake of order that we talk about them. So you do have to understand that leading a prayer is a serious matter. You are leading the people of God. You are taking charge of the assembly. So I don't think it's something that should be done lightly. Uh, I don't think it's something that should be done uh, as a novelty or where we seek novelty. It should be done, as he said, with holy hands. Um, and then we go to 1 Corinthians 14, just like that. Because this also is talking about decency and order, and it's important to note the things that they were told and why they were told this, because it teaches us how to do the same thing in terms of worship today. So, the question from, from Paul, <laughs> who by the 14th chapter is running out of ways to say, y'all are crazy. <laughs> what then, brothers? <laughs> when you come together... Each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let everything be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, that is, in a foreign language, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what has been said. If a revelation is made to another who is sitting there, let the first be silent. You can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged, and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. It's very, very similar to what we read in First Timothy about the learning quietly and, and in submission, asking the husband at home, not allowed to teach or take authority. That's very similar, and the reason is because it's identical. It's the same thing, the same context, public address of the assembly. So first then, he says, when you come together, that's the assembly. That's the church. <laughs> We're gathered in public. This is a, everybody. He said, now when you come together, Every member has something that they want to bring forward to benefit the church, or well, or maybe not to benefit the church, but they have every they got something they want to bring forward. A hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Right? We still have hymns and lessons. Uh, maybe you'd argue we have interpretation in a way. I don't know. But you know, the revelation is complete. The tongues have ceased. They, we don't need them anymore. That's fine. I'm not too con um, concerned about that. But they're still useful instruction. He said, we come together and we have all these things that we do. And you can see how those would fit into a worship service. Obviously, a hymn is part of our songs. And the lesson, well, we do those. Whether in class or in a sermon format, it's still teaching. Um, revelation, we would replace by Bible reading, which is the revelation of God. Uh, the tongue is the same thing. The interpretation of the tongue. Those, all three of those fit as the Bible, really. But whatever it is that you bring to the assembly, let it be done for building up. 
So it has to be something that is made for encouraging, for strengthening, for growing, for learning. People have to be able to learn from it. And if they can't learn from it, then you don't need to bring it to the assembly. Um, if, if it can be changed, if it can be improved or honed in some way, change, uh, altered so that people can understand and get encouragement and instruction from it, then do so. But if it can't, then don't do that. Right? And what I'm thinking of is like, for example, there are sometimes people who are teaching or preaching who should not be doing so because they're simply not capable of getting a point across clearly. Though they may be intelligent, though they may be faithful. And when you talk with them, they, they're speaking the truth. They would have the truth. They know the truth. But they just cannot get it across. People come away confused every time, not sure what has been said or where we just went and why we were going there. That's not working. That has to stop at some point. Right? And, and it's for building up. You have to be able to learn from it. You have to be able to encourage one another. If it's not building, you know, if it's not edifying, if it's not encouraging, then it shouldn't be happening. Because we have enough discouragement in the world. <laughs> we don't need aggravation and discouragement in the assembly of the Lord. It's just an example, but you get the idea. Some things work and some things don't work. And, and it's not a reflection or a judgment on an individual. It's just the way that it is. Different people have different things that they bring to the table. Let's talk about tongues. People love the tongues, the Pentecostal idea and all that, the charismatic movements, all that stuff. And, you know, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, the, the Pentecostal instruction. You know, I would think this is kind of the only verse you need when you study with these people because it is never, ever the case in any of these assemblies where they claim that they have miraculous Holy Spirit speaking in tongues happening, they are never doing what 1 Corinthians 14 requires the church to do. Look at it again. If anybody speaks in a tongue, that is in a foreign language, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret if there is no interpreter, then let them keep silent in church and speak to himself, to God alone. Keep silent is a nice way of saying it. it it's really kind of shut up. No sound from you. It's really what it means. So, all right, the speaking in the tongue, again, all they were saying were things that were the words of God, which we now have in the Bible, we don't need the tongues anymore. Fair enough. But nonetheless, it was a way in which God would communicate with the churches and get to them the information that you and I have in a Bible before they had a completion of the Bible. That was something that was happening. You have a congregation, you got, say, five people who can speak a foreign language, a language that nobody here knows, and the thing they're saying is God's word. Maybe let's say that they're saying the letter of Philemon. But you don't know, and I don't know, because we can't understand anything he's saying. Right? You got five of these people. There has to be an interpreter, somebody who has the ability to interpret what's being said. So to the one, perhaps, the revelation is being made, and he's reading aloud or, or saying aloud these things. Like we said, for our example, let's say the letter of Philemon. And he says a sentence or two. There has to be another person there who also has a miraculous ability, in this case, the ability to interpret, who can understand what he's saying and then put that forth in the common tongue. And if that isn't present, then the guy who can give you the entire letter of Philemon in a foreign language you don't know, if there's nobody to interpret the language that he is speaking, he's not allowed to speak. 
Not one word in a foreign language can he speak. It has to be intelligible to the congregation. Even though he has the Spirit of God, even though he has an ability that's an incredible thing, the speaking in tongues, and he has, and the thing that he's giving is a knowledge that comes direct from God. It's a revelation from the Holy Spirit. That's all excellent and good, but it's absolutely useless if nobody understands what you're saying. So there has to be an interpreter. And in an assembly, when there's nobody to interpret, that guy is not allowed to say anything. The only things that can be said are things that can be understood. And if there's five of them who have the ability to speak, too bad. He said there can be only two, or at the most, three. Maybe two of them go short. <laughs> but two, or at the most, three. Limit the number of speakers. Limit the time of speaking, dare I say. And I know people are like, oh yeah, that's right. Time we got back to the 15-minute sermon. Yeah, well, <laughs> I hope that there's more information than that that is useful to you. Um, but I also know that, you know, sometimes you'll sit in a meeting and some guy will talk for an hour and a half or, or longer, and there's no way you can absorb all of that in one sitting. Oh, maybe you guys want to take a break. Maybe you want to talk and, and, and then maybe have some songs and come back and talk some more or whatever. If you have a lot to cover, maybe you spend a day. But Nobody's going to listen for an hour and a half straight. Nobody can listen. You can't take all that information in. Let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn. They can't even do it at the same time. They have to do it one at a time. So that's also true. When we are assembled, speech has to be intelligible. It has to be a building. It has to be um, uh, in turn, one at a time. You don't have multiple people talking. Confusion is what ensues, if that's the case. You cannot have unintelligible communication going on in the church. It needs to be understood and understandable. And I think that's a very important thing that should, you know, the importance of it should not be overlooked. Uh, we want people to learn and we want people to grow, but we have a responsibility to the assembly as well. Um, if, you know, if, if someone is going to teach, they need to be able to teach. Um, everybody can learn and be encouraged. Uh, there doesn't need to be any confusion engendered by the way that we conduct the service. As for the prophets, what did the prophets say? Well, they were speaking the word of God in your native or common tongue, not in a foreign tongue, but in the common tongue. Even they let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. So very similar, two or three maybe if they go short. And let the others weigh what is said. But I like the fact that he puts limits on it because it shows us, you know, God knows the mind and he knows the, the body and he knows what it is to be in the body. <laughs> and I understand people say, well, they were with Jesus for several days and then he fed them. Yeah, okay. Um, but, you know, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I'm just a servant, and we're doing the best we can. And, you know, I think that God knows what our minds are capable of and what we can handle and what we can hold on to. And observing limits is good. You should observe them. And frankly, as uh, you know, this, this is now opinion. But as a preacher, <laughs> having paid attention over the years to response and uptake, um, you really don't get more out of a 45-minute sermon than you do out of a 25-minute sermon. The content is about, you know, what people take away from it is about the same. Um, now, I, I understand I usually go longer than 25, but I'm trying to do more ex explanations these days. But really, people don't take that much more they're sitting, they're being talked at. It's not an interactive format, our, our sermon format, the way that we do things in our culture. Um, so yeah, let two or three speak and let others weigh what is said. So when, <laughs> when somebody teaches, other teachers have the ability to weigh, to weigh that, to say something about that. 
And I'm reminded of the man, the evangelist, so-called, who stood up and said, I am, you know, I am only speaking my opinion. I would not be so bold as to say that I know anything from the Bible. And another man who is a teacher in that congregation said, did I understand you correctly to say that you were there to speak your opinion and your opinion only? And he said, yes. And the brother said, well, then you need to sit down. I did not come here to hear your opinion. So a prophet spoke and another prophet weighed in. <laughs> if a revelation is made to another who's sitting there, let the first be silent. So... One prophet is speaking, another prophet immediately gets something from God. It's time for that prophet to speak. Let the other one be silent and sit down and let this one go. It's two or three at the most. You can all prophesy one by one, just like the tongues, one at a time, take turns. The reason for this is that all may learn and be encouraged, and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. This also is that odds with what you see in modern religion where the spirit takes over and they're out of control not so if it's the spirit of god the spirit of prophet of the prophet is subject to the prophet the prophet is in control of whether or not to he is speaking at the moment or she which is what the rest of this is about right but the point is everybody can learn <clears throat> everybody can be encouraged and you are supposed to be in control of what you're saying and what you're doing. There's no confusion coming because of that. Um, you know, when, when you're talking, it's not an emotional thing. It's not anger. Uh, as we said earlier, lifting holy hands without quarreling, without anger. It's, it's not that kind of stuff that's out of control. The pro, the Spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, means that what you come to do, you're in control of that. And you take it seriously because you have the floor, you're in charge, you're leading the congregation. Because God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, that is, all of the assemblies of those who have been made holy in God. If it is a godly assembly, if it's a, an assembly of God's people, then it is not a, an assembly of confusion, but an assembly of peace. And he closes this with, the women should keep silent in the churches. Now, it doesn't say women should keep silent. It says the women. The reason for my pointing this out is that, what women? The women prophets. <laughs> the women tongue speakers, the women interpreters. They are not allowed to speak in the assembly and take the floor. That's authority, exercising authority over the assembly. They can't do that. That's not allowed. They're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. It doesn't mean that people of the female gender <laughs> in the human species, um, cannot utter a single word when the church is gathered. It's not talking about that at all. That's has, that has lifted this entirely from its context. It's clear what he's saying. The prophets, or uh, the tongue speakers, can address the assembly, but only two or three, and only if somebody can interpret. Otherwise, you be silent. Just like this, silent here, with the women should keep silent. Um, and the prophets can speak, but only two or three of them, and only if a revelation hasn't come to one of the other prophets. They're subject to each other, in addition to being subject to the Lord and the assembly. The women prophets, though, are not allowed to address the congregation, the, the assembly, the congregation. The women uh, speakers in tongues are not allowed to address the assembly. The women interpreters are not allowed to address the assembly. That's all that he's saying. If, you know, and if there's anything for them to learn, then let them ask the husband at home. It's shameful for them to speak in church. So in the, that's to say to speak in the assembly, to address the assembly by having the floor exercising authority over them. 
So let's talk about this roles for men and women. But um, again, the, ma- the, the meat of that lesson is the order, the decency, the way that he says we're taking turns. Uh, we're doing it in a measured way. We are in control of ourselves. We are in charge when we are leading in uh, the case of prayers or whatever else it might be. This is all of it helping us with how services can be orderly. But it is also the case that different roles for men and women are part of these teachings. And so what really ties them together, why are men's and women's roles part of the decency and order of the worship service? Well, because the issue at hand is authority. Who is the authority in the assembly of the anointed Son of God? Well, God is the authority. And so we we have to deal with that. So again, the women, there were women who were prophets. And there was Deborah, who was a judge, for example. And there are other women who were prophets. Um... And there was the woman who put a spike through Cicero's head. I can't remember her name. I'm sorry. But um, it's an amazing thing to think about how God actually lifts and exalts women in the Bible. That's not the issue. They can be prophets. They just weren't allowed to address the assembly because in the assembly we um, understand that that preaching, that teaching, that leading of prayers and of songs is authority. That's taking charge. And it's simply not the order that God has put in place for spiritual matters. Now, on the other hand, you would say, does she speak in the assembly? Well, yes, she does. Um, Women can ask questions in, in our classes. They can make comments in our classes. They can answer questions when they're called upon. Um, you know, if somebody is giving announcements and asks for information, a woman is allowed to give information in response to that request. The person who's giving the announcements still has the floor and is still in control. So that's that person is in authority. There's no loss of order. There's no lack of subjection there. And by the way, when the leader um, has the floor, if that's the announcements or the preaching or the song leading, that person has the floor. So just because you um, are eligible to lead singing doesn't mean that you can lead a song from your seat. (laughs) Or you can choose to sing a different song from the one the song leader is leading, or a different verse, or a different tune. You can't make those choices. That person is the leader. That person has the floor. We are in subjection to one another in the fear of Christ. It's the exact same thing. Because God is the authority. Now, again, does she speak? Does a woman speak in the assembly? Of course, they do it all the time. Answering questions is fine. Making comments is fine. And Ephesians 5.19, we are addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs by singing. Addressing one another is speaking to one another, and it's the same speak as we read in the other passages. Okay, so we're when we are singing, we are speaking to one another, and that is okay. We're in subjection to one another, and the person leading the singing has the floor. That person is in charge. We're not breaking any chain of authority. We're not introducing any confusion by singing in this way, and yet you're speaking. Um, likewise, women can and do teach in the same way. The singing is teaching and admonishing one another with singing the psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs. So this also is happening, but it's not in a way that is, you know, taking charge, that is uh, taking authority. The leader has the floor. The leader is in authority. The rest of us are in subjection to the leader and to one another, and we sing. In that singing, we are speaking, yes, and we are teaching and admonishing, too. We do all of these things. It's not that she can't teach. Then others will say, well, then how can she have a Bible class? Well, she can have a class. 
She's not exercising authority over men by teaching a class that does not contain men. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, they can and they do teach, and, and I see no reason why not. But, you know, again, uh, understand that in the scriptures, you can't get away from the fact that everybody in the assembly speaks in the assembly when we sing. Everybody in the assembly teaches in the assembly when we sing. That's the truth. The thing that is at issue is not speaking and teaching. The thing that is at issue is authority and taking charge, taking the lead. That's the thing that needs to be considered. Who should be in charge? And why is that so? What qualifies that person to be in charge? And are the rest of us right to be sub subject to that person? Um, that's the way that God has ordered things. So sometimes people will say, I have a talent. Um, a lot of times, you know, there are more and more churches where the women are preaching and the women are leading prayers. Um, I did attend one in Connecticut where they had women uh, serving the Lord's Supper, um, which was surprising. I, I didn't expect what happened to happen. And apparently they also would entertain women preachers as well uh, in that particular congregation. Although I will say it's a point of order. I mean, that's a matter of let's look at these passages together, friend, and understand the way that this should be done and do it that way. The thing that really bothered me in that assembly was not so much that there were women on the Lord's table the thing that really bothered me was that the guy who was in charge of the Lord's table um, didn't mention Jesus at all. He talked entirely about the sacrifice that war veterans make for our country um, because it was Memorial Day coming up. And that, to me, is a pretty serious problem. Uh, the, the women leading the prayers is a point of order. You can correct that by looking at what the scriptures teach and bringing ourselves into conformity. That's decency and order. That's just rules. You can do that. Leading the Lord's table and substituting war veterans is a pretty egregious sin. That is a real lack of understanding. That guy should never have had the floor. He knows nothing. So that's a much more troubling, right? Um, not that you know, one amounts to something greater in terms of sin than another, but just to say, one thing can be corrected fairly simply. <laughs> another thing is a pretty serious problem. So when we come together, we come together to build each other up. As for the women who are teaching like that, they say, well, look, God has blessed me with teaching. I can do a better job teaching than half the brothers out there. And I, I have no doubt that that's true. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of women who would do a much better do job teaching than I do. Um, and there are plenty of women who would do a much better job than most preachers do. That's fine. I understand that. But it's what Paul said earlier. What then, brethren, when you come together, each one has this and that and the other that they want to do. You can't do everything. Two or three at the most. And only if there's an interpreter. And take turns. Right, there have to be rules imposed, limits on this. Uh, yeah, the person who could speak in a foreign language would say, look, God gave me this great talent, this great blessing that I should be able to share with others. There's so much good content there. Um, if only people would listen. Well, but they can't listen if they can't understand you. <laughs> so you can't speak without an interpreter. And they can't listen if their brain is full. There's already been three guys and three prophets before that. You know, another time. Next time we get together. Right? You have to hang on to it. That's subjection. That's the way it is. We sometimes have the ability to do things that we don't do as a point of order, and perhaps, or as, you know, one of the other 
I guess it's as a point of order of one or the other kind. We're out of time. We're out of place. We're not observing authority. How are you going to teach about God's authority and, and how are you going to teach about decency and order and about respecting God above self when you yourself are breaking God's rules to speak? You can't. It won't work. Um, so that's the lesson. Um, I think decency and order is an important thing and it, and it touches more than prayers, obviously, but I think that's important to understand about prayers, too. They have to be intelligible. They have to build people up. Uh, they can't be confusion. You know, there's many things that follow this rule. And we are all of us to be subject to the one who's leading the prayer. While that person has the floor. So there you have it. That is the uh, lesson for today on, on this topic. Let me know, by all means, if there are any uh, follow-up questions or other points of order that have been overlooked. I will accept that feedback graciously. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian to be right with God. It's more than a point of order. It is a serious thing, as we talked about with the Lord's Supper. Jesus gave his life. He died for us that we might live, and that is very important. It's true that war veterans have made sacrifices for us and that we owe them and we should show kindness to them. And if you find one in public, you should get his lunch or get his gas or whatever, wherever you find them. Do that because we owe them our lives. They sacrificed. They put themselves on the line for us. And yet what Jesus did is so much greater than that. He, they deliver us from an, a temporal enemy, a problem in the flesh. But Jesus delivers us from sin and from death with eternal consequence and weight. So that's far more important and far more to be respected and and uh, and uh, appreciated. If we can help you to obey the gospel, we'll help you do that. Be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins based on your repentant heart. If today you are already a Christian but have not lived the way that you ought to live, let us help you with our prayers on your behalf God will hear us. If you need our prayers, you need to be baptized. Let that be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing.